We are live. Welcome to 1988's Willow Review and Thoughts film. So, this, yeah, since these videos get long, I'm going to start by saying I quite enjoyed this movie. I'm not sure I would quite say I loved it, but I liked it a lot. And there will be some jokes in this video, and it's not going to be a particularly serious video. I realize this video is long. I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. And this movie is rated PG, and so is this video. So, yeah, just real quick. Whether you love or hate this movie, you know, that's fine by me. The only thing I ask, you know, if, if you leave a comment, the only thing I ask is you be respectful towards me and towards the people you disagree with on the movie. And... Right, so I don't watch, I'm not the biggest fan of fantasy, but I can appreciate when it's done really well. So, you know, I love the Lord of the Rings trilogy. I like a lot of the Hobbit trilogy, some would say more than I should. I love the never-ending story, although I will admit by now, I don't remember my, The only thing I remember is that I absolutely loved it, and I did watch it more than once, so it's not just like... Yeah, I, I... I had a chance to really think about what was in it. It just... That was a lot of years ago by now. I watched the second one. I thought it was terrible. I love the movie Legend with Tom Cruise, especially the... I think he's credited as The Darkness, played by Tim Curry. Yeah, it's absolutely amazing. I love the first Conan movie. I thought the second one was garbage. I think I watched... What was it called? Red, Red Sonia? That was also quite bad. Although, I mean, it had a vision. Some stuff worked. And I love Norse myth and Greek myth. Now, that brings us... Right, since we're still dealing with Corona, I want to say, during this video, it is possible that I will touch my face. I want to assure you, I washed my hands since the last time I was outside, and I will wash my hands again before going out. Now, I'm not 100% certain how many times I watched this, but I'm almost certain it was more than once. I, If I had to say, I probably watched this two or three times in the 90s, and then I watched it again today, you know, and, and hit record very soon after. And... Yeah, so... For the, for the plot, I'm going to quote the IMDb plot thing. A young farmer is chosen to undertake a perilous journey in order to protect a special baby from an evil queen. And that brings us to the writing. Now, the, yeah, so this was written, the, the story was written by George Lucas and the screenplay by Bob Dolman. Now, yeah, for George Lucas, I watched all of Star Wars and I watched... American Graffiti and THX 1138. And I'm I'm quite a fan of George Lucas, especially the original trilogy, especially episodes four and five. And see, for Bob Dolman, other than this, he also wrote the screenplay and story for Far and Away, which I also watched. And it's it's pretty good. I uh, he let's see, he wrote the Banger Sisters, How to Eat Fried Worms, and The Elf Queen, which The Elf Queen is apparently brand new. I haven't watched those. I haven't even heard... I, I heard of The Banger Sisters, but 
yeah, I, th I think they did uh, a pretty good job writing. There's a lot of, like, interesting things that you, ah, what's the word? Like, there's, there's a pretty decent amount of lore without it being overwhelming. Like, if you get super into this movie, you can focus on all the the places you're told about, the individuals, the the magic abilities, you know, the the prophecy, all of these different things. But if you just want, you know, casually watch it, you're not going to be completely lost either. You know, it's 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 fairly easy to quickly explain what the overall idea is which is also good because again it is in part made for children now yeah you know uh, after george lucas made star wars he you know and yeah, you know, basically, he tried to do with this movie for short and sorcery what he did for space opera and whatever subgenre in Janet Jones is. I honestly don't know the name. Apparently, it's not Swashbuckler because that has more like sword fighting than Indiana Jones. So, yeah. But I. I think. It. <laughs> I think there was a chance for this to, to really work. You know, part of the problem is probably the script, which underserves some characters, I suppose. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to talk about who in the thought sections, but I think it's a little bit too much of a spoiler. And I like Ron Howard. He seems like a good person and he has directed some stuff that I really love. I'm not sure he's the right person to, to for for fantasy. He's he's really great at like personal drama. Like the things of his that I've watched that I hold in highest regard are Frost Nixon, A Beautiful Mind, and Parenthood. And again, I think he did I think Far and Away is good. I th I liked Backdraft, I think, but I'm not sure I've watched it more than once. Uh, yeah, I think those are all the... Oh, oh, right. I already forgot he directed Solo. That's that's how... I don't hate that movie, but it evidently wasn't that memorable to me because I watched it very recently and I already forgot he directed it. But yeah, I'm not going to touch on i i understand that some people really hate i think it was the grinch and i can understand I've, I've seen clips it looks terrible but yeah I've, I've heard some describe him as oh right he also directed splash i think i like that but i when i it's been a lot of years i probably haven't watched that movie in 20 maybe even 30 years so yeah the uh I've heard some people say that he's a he's a director with no personality. And I think there is some truth to that. And I think it works when he's doing a movie where the where you don't really need the director to add very much. You just need you you essentially need him to stand step aside and just let the story and actors do do the work and that's why a beautiful mind and frost nixon work and with this movie you can't completely do that you need a little bit more and yeah that is where he struggles now i uh, i forget exactly who but i it was an interview with uh, one of the creatives they were talking specifically about the upcoming Disney Plus show, and yeah, that is that is why I'm doing a video on it now. I wanted to make sure to do a video on it before the Disney Plus show comes out. And yes, currently it's listed for like almost half a year from now, but it might get moved up or I might end up being really busy with something, so I wanted to make sure. In the interview, he said that 
it was the first realistic, gritty version of fantasy and really opened the door for Lord of the Rings and Game of Thrones. I think that might be very true. Yeah, when I think about other 80s fantasy, I wouldn't really describe it as gritty. So, some of it was good, for sure. But I'm not sure I would really use the term gritty about it. And, yeah, part of the reason that it was Ron Howard doing this was that Lucas, George Lucas, wanted a, well, let's see, Lucas felt that he and Howard shared a symbiotic relationship similar to the one he enjoyed with Steven Spielberg. Now, if you're, you know, if you're a little rusty on the details, Steven Spielberg directed the Indiana Jones movies. George Lucas wrote them. So, yeah, you know, he wanted some... Yeah, and yeah, ultimately, like, Ron Howard probably wasn't quite the right... It's it's wild, because his daughter, Bryce Dallas Howard, when she isn't starring in, I hear, terrible Jurassic movies, she's an incredible director for this kind of other world... Like, she's directed some of the very best episodes of The Mandalorian on Disney+, Plus, but her father is not good at directing Star Wars or fantasy, so yeah. And I do think, I think some of the stuff in this movie does really work, but it could be at least a little better. Now, the opening of the movie is really effective. We, we quickly get a sense of how bad things are, and we get a glimmer of hope, and basically that glimmer is, I mean, essentially, this is an entire movie about trying to protect this, this one baby and, and trying to make sure that nothing happens to it, nothing happens to her. And, yeah, it, it's, they, they do a really great job with the, with the intro. I mean, if you want to make someone seem incredibly evil, have them threaten a child, maybe even, in this case, an infant. That's immediately going to get, you know, that's that's the shorthand for evil, is, is threatening, yeah. Now, I am not going to give away whether the ending is happy or sad, but I will give away, uh, I will go into, it does fit with what came before. I think the ending is quite good. There's no Deus Ex Machina or other convenient writing. And I do think one thing that works, you know, I, yeah, George Lucas, for this, he took idea, he borrowed things from various things, including Star Wars itself, and, yeah, basically tried to craft something new that had a lot of the, a, a lot of parts that felt familiar to people. And it is honestly, it is a little surprising that this movie wasn't better received than it was. I will grant for sure, if Star Wars A New Hope and Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back are definitely better movies, but when you look at how, I don't know, maybe, maybe you could only really do that kind of thing once? Maybe people were more ready for something like Star Wars. Yeah, I, I... I can understand why this has a cult following, for sure. Now, the movie stars Warwick Davis, although the poor guy didn't even get, like, he doesn't get first billing, he gets, like, third billing, even though he's the lead character and has more screen time than... Yeah, anyway... I don't know, I, I guess he, maybe the studio thought he wasn't a big enough name or something, or, yeah, they, they didn't like the idea of a dwarf having first billing, I, if it's not that, I, if, if, if you know what it is, please post it in the comments, because I would love for that not to be the case, but I don't know what else it is, he's clearly the lead, He's a positive de depiction of a character, like, like the, yeah, the character is, like, a good role model for children. He's, like, like, I could understand it if it was, like, 
Let's see. I don't know how high billing Dave Chappelle has in Robin Hood Men in Tights. If he has a lower billing than he should by virtue of his screen time, I could understand if some would say, but he's constantly making these jokes that are really racy, you know, and I, I think that movie is like a PG-13, you know, I guess a better example, honestly, yeah, a better example would be Con Air. In that movie, he makes a lot of off-color jokes, and yeah, one could understand if that was, it made the, the studio a little uneasy. Anyway, Warwick Davis stars as Willow of Good, a Nelwyn dwarf and aspiring sorcerer who plays, let's see, yeah, plays a critical role in protecting this infant. For the, yeah, his charm and his smile are just like warm. Like you, you can't look at him smile and not be like elated. It's yeah, and. It's, it's wild to think he was only 17, and it is also, like, when you think about that, and then he, like, he has children that are old enough to walk and speak, so that makes it slightly uncomfortable, but, it's, yeah. One, one critic pointed out, Willow himself takes care of the baby, something usually done by female characters in movies, and it also, it doesn't, like, he's not, like, a walking punchline because of that, which usually is... You know, that's very frequently what happens if a male character in a movie takes on a female role. That they get constantly mocked for it. Now let's see. Yeah, and Val Kilmer plays Mad Martigan, a boastful let's see. Yeah, mer mercenary swordsman who helps Willow on his quest and According to IMDb Trivia, Val Kilmer ad-libbed much of his dialogue. And it does, like, he gets the kind of... He, he understands what this character is about, and he doesn't try to change that. Like, this is a character who'll do some really uh, unseemly things, and, and he's not positioned as a, as a role model at all. Like, the kid's... You know, he's he's like the cool uncle kind of thing for, for the kids. Willow is clearly the actual role model. But, yeah, you know, he understands the character. He understands there's the, you know, I'm going to quote a fellow critic here. Val Kilmer does pretty good as the cocky and somewhat arrogant Mad Mardigan. Much like Jack Burton in Big Trouble Little China, Mad Mardigan is a skilled fighter, but is very clearly out of his depth in a lot of the scenes as he fights things that are bigger than him. He also does comedy very well. Unfortunately for him, as awesome as he is, he doesn't hold a candle to Kurt Russell in that role, or to Harrison Ford in the role that he's essentially the medieval European fantasy version of. Yeah. And... Yeah, some I saw one critic who said that the pairing of Mad Mardigan and Willow is even better than Frodo and oh Aragon. Uh, yeah, I remembered it as yeah. Okay, fair enough. I think that might be. Let's see. I th yeah. See, I remembered that they didn't like Frodo and someone else. I thought it was Samwise, and I was like, okay, hold up a minute. There is no way that Willow and Mad Mardigan are a more compelling pairing than Frodo and Samwise Gamgee. But more than Frodo and Aragorn, that I think there is a, a case to be made. And, and I would also say that this movie makes an effort for that more, you know, Lord of the Rings, Aragorn is yeah it's it's not as much that he's yeah now let's see. 
Mad Mardigan is smart-mouthed, charming, grumpy, and endearing. One part hammy, two parts braggadocio. And... Now, yeah, some people say that Mad Mardigan steals the movie from Willow. I can understand where they're coming from. Yeah, I, before I get into it, I will... In, there, There's a few more characters that I need to briefly get into, because what I'm about to say refer, refers to them as well. Now, Joanne Whaley plays Sorsha, Bavmorda's warrior, uh, evil queen Bavmordia, Bavmorda's warrior daughter, and yeah, she's present. She's definitely in this movie. Jean Marsh plays Queen Bavmorda, the villainous ruler of Nakmar, a powerful black sorceress mother of Sorsha. And uh, yeah, IMDb Trivia notes that her role is similar to Jean Marsh's role in Return to Oz, and there's apparently also a, a Doctor Who episode from 1989. I feel like if I say the title, that's possibly a spoiler for it. I don't know. I haven't watched Doctor Who. I am aware of the existence and some of the casting, but that's it. But yeah, the she is very memorable as the evil. Yeah. Now I uh, let's see. Yeah, I'm going to quote a fellow creator. Bavmorda is a cardboard villain, evil purely for the sake of being evil. Lucas' story might have dwelled a little on the unusual relationship of a tyrant sorceress with a swordswoman for a daughter, but the script never allows the slightest reflection on how Sorsha feels towards her witchy mother. As with most sword and sorcery films, there are no deeper metaphysical themes to the concept of magic. Spells are just another weapon. And... Let's see. Uh, yeah. Patricia Hayes, R.I.P., played Finn Raziel. Re Rezel? Ah, crap. I already forgot how to pronounce it. Who is a sorceress, and I'm not going to give more. She, she gives some wise advice. And... Billy Barty, R.I.P., played the High Aldwin, the Nelvin wizard who commissions Willow to go on his journey, realizing the potential that Willow possesses. And Pat Roach, R.I.P., played General Kale, the villainous associate to Queen Bavmorda, High Commander of her army. Gavin O'Herlihy, R.I.P., as Eric Thogbear, the military commander of the... Yeah, military commander. And Maria Holwer as Chalindria, the fairy queen who resides... Yeah. She gives... She, she also... You know, she, she... Yeah, she conveys some important information. And... I think I remember liking her a lot when, when I was a child. I could definitely see, like, if the first time you watch this, uh, you are a child, you could really, like, yeah, you know, Fairy Queen. It's it. I don't think I really need to expand on that concept for you to know. But, yeah, it, you know, there's this, there's a, there's a sweetness to her and, yeah, you know, she, she comes across as a good person, good creature. And Kevin Pollock and Rick Overton plays Rule and Frank John, a duo of what the film referred to as brownies, which they're, they're about yay high. So, you know, they, they took a story where the lead is a dwarf and then they added creatures that are even smaller. Yeah. And some of the time, the effects don't really hold up. And it's, it's one of the few that, that don't hold up. But 
Other times it works out fine. The some critics have have said that the you know the reason the brownies are there are so that they can be funny, but it wasn't necessary. The movie was already funny due to the bickering between Willow and Matt Mardigan. I I'm not sure I thought anything the brownies said or did was funny. I personally didn't really find the the bickering funny, but I did think parts of the movie were funny and for sure you know both Kilmer and Davis give strong performances. I would say of this movie the sincere moments, the lore, the character moments work but the comic relief is likely to feel annoying and too frequent for many adults who didn't watch it as children. Comparatively, Star Wars A New Hope and Empire Strikes Back fare a lot better in this regard. And I say that as someone who did watch this as a child and didn't watch Star Wars until I was a teenager. So, if anything, I should feel the opposite way, but yeah. Personally, I think it would be great if they made an alternate cut that really trimmed out a lot of the comic relief. Of course, this would mean getting rid of a lot of Val Kilmer's screen time, but there are other benefits too. Seriously though, when he's... when they're not trying really hard to... when he's sincere and he's supposed to be cool and such, I thought that really worked. Now... I think that pretty much... Right, I do want to briefly say the... Mark Northover, RIP, plays Burglecut, the leader of the Nelvin Village Council who maintains a running enmity with Willow, and he does give a really great performance. Like, we can't stand him, but we're supposed to find him obnoxious. So, it 100% it works. And it is really cool to see, like, they got a lot of dwarf actors for this. Uh, you know, the, the, um, yeah. And, you know, Kenny Baker, RIP, who used to play R2-D2, does actually appear in this. But it just says, Nelwyn Band Member, uncredited. So, which is which is kind of wild, because, like, if you said R2, he's, he's the one who plays R2-D2, you know, everybody know, everybody, in 1988, everybody knew who R2-D2 was, but Kenny Baker was still getting uncredited work on George Lucas stuff. Yeah, anyway... But yeah, Tony Cox is also there, for example, and I th think I spotted at least one other that I... Uh, thing is, I don't remember their names that well, but yeah. Let's see. That brings us... Yeah, so the dialogue a lot. There's a lot of bickering, a lot of people calling each other names and saying this is going to fail and, and stuff like that. But on occasion, they will actually, like, say some nice things. Like, like I, th I would say the movie is communicating that just because someone argues doesn't mean that they don't care about you. I do think there's an excess, but, you know... Some people really love it, and I respect that. Now, the cinematography was handled by DP Adrian Biddle, RIP. And, yeah, they have 25 credits to their name. And, yeah, they actually they kept working until 2005 when they DP'd V for Vendetta. And... Yeah, they also DP'd Aliens, so tremendous talent. And yeah, they, they did a really great job here. And the editing was handled by 
Daniel P. Hanley, Mike Hill, and Richard Hiscott. Now, Hanley had has 30 credits, something as recent as 2016 as editor. Mike Hill has 27, something as recent as 2015. And Hiscott has 10 as editorial department. This is actually the only one that he's listed as the editor of. And all his credits are as editorial department are from before this. But yeah, the editing also does a, a good job. Like the the cinematography and editing work together well to heighten sort of like there are some scenes that are supposed to be hopeful, there are scenes that are supposed to be funny, there are scenes that are supposed to be scary. And yeah, the, the camera work and editing do a lot of legwork there. And again, I wasn't the biggest fan of the comedy, but largely it worked. Like, fairly rarely was this not... yeah. Now, this was made on a budget of $35 million, and the box office was 136... 740... 137.6 million dollars so that's pretty good and this was filmed in New Zealand California Ireland Wales let's see yeah and See what's that say? Uh, Hertfordshire, in England, and let's see. yeah, I'm gonna quote a fellow critic. The saving grace of the film is the locations. These actors are allowed to stumble around in some of the most beautiful landscapes on earth. However, there is little coherence to the feeling of the fantasy world. It looks like it was shot at various locations in Asia and Europe with a little North America thrown in. Director Ron Howard and producer storyteller George Lucas do not seem to worry about this. And that is something that is true. Like, there are times, some of the time it's like, it seems like, okay, we're in the summer, and this is like a good, you know, it's one of the first locations we see are, uh, is this Nelwyn village, and yeah, Willow is a farmer, he's trying to be a magician, uh, uh, sorcerer, he, he's working, he's trying to work his way towards being a sorcerer, but currently he is a farmer, and we see him, like, plowing a field, and look, yeah, look, okay, it's summer, it's, it, you know, the, the soil is moist and the whole thing. But then, not long after, they're in this area that's, like, covered in snow and looks incredibly cold. And it's like, did they really walk between these two areas on foot in little time? Even though they're, like, farmers, normal, like, they're not travelers, you know, so they're, they're, like, yeah. Again, I, I'm not, you know, this is not going to blow anybody's mind, but a farmer tends to stay in the same place to, to, you know, tend to the farm he has that doesn't move around. But, yeah, she's, you know, on foot within what seems like just very little time, maybe a few days, I guess, they're in this place, like, snow that's and and it looks like the snow has been there for like weeks maybe months so it it's just yeah and it's too bad because it does the, these are some really stunning places visually and yeah so the following is a, a response to something Roger Ebert RIP wrote about this movie what does Ebert mean when he says nothing happens in the movie? There are battles, chases, treks through snow and ice and cavernous terrain, sword fights, sorcery. Yeah. Now, let's see. 
Yeah, well, and a critic said, It has long passages where my attention wanders, such as chases and bloodless PG battle scenes. I understand where they're coming from. I thought the every time the movie tried to be exciting, I thought it worked. And I've seen movies from around this time where, like, stuff, you know... I, t I try not to judge a movie, at least, like, production-wise, on stuff that's come out since. At least not a long time later. But, yeah, some, some movies from the 80s really, by today's... Uh, I, I don't personally think are that exciting to watch. But this one, yeah, I was, every single action scene, I was deeply engaged. And there's a, a pretty good amount of them. And there's a, there's a gradual increase. Like, it starts quite small. It's like, there's, one of, the, one, of the first, one of the first scenes in the movie is an action scene. But it starts small compared to where it goes later. And gradually over the course of the movie, it increases. And by the end, we have some really grand, epic action scenes. You know, I, th I thought they did a really great job on that. Not just going completely wild from the start. Like, at the start of the movie, you understand that there are very dangerous things out there, even if we aren't seeing them yet. And that makes the anticipation work really well. There's this scene of like a horse-drawn carriage that's, you know, moving, moving very fast. And all along this action scene, the tension, the build-up, and the use of established elements all work really well. Like, there are multiple individual fights going on on this carriage. And, like, there are, you know, horse... Yeah, there, there are enemies on horseback that are trying to catch up to the, to the carriage and fighting on top of the carriage. Just, yeah, a ton of really cool stuff. Now, the... The score was handled by James Horner, R.I.P. Yeah. Again, I'm not sure I really need to go into a lot of detail, but just briefly. In his career, he scored 121 movies. Something as late as The Magnificent Seven in 2016. And, yeah, you know, he, he provides the movie with... Um, an epic, really grand score, and yeah, it it works. You're like it really gets you into the the scenes. There's some really great sound design. You know, there are creatures in this that don't exist in the real world, so they have to come up with something that you know it's not Star Wars. It's not, but. There are some really cool, yeah. Now, the pacing... I thought there were chunks of it where they spent too long just bickering and, and like, people putting down characters that we, the audience, have sympathy for. But... Yeah, you know, I... I'm not sure, I guess I probably wasn't the ideal, the, the target audience when I was a child either. So, you know, a lot of people love this as children and still love it today. So it's really cool that it's on Disney Plus and that we're getting a sequel miniseries. Or possibly series, I forget if they're, yeah. Now, the movie is two hours and one minute long without end credits and two hours, six minutes and 41 seconds long with them. Now, it's a movie where actions have consequences, and there, 
there is at least one character who expresses a certain point of view and you can tell that the audience isn't supposed to actually consider that point of view they're supposed to think oh that's the wrong point of view because of who's saying it and yeah so the best element of this i would say is a you know making it a gritty fantasy now yeah for my yeah the worst aspect i thought was the worst of the comic relief so especially the brownie duo but also some of the time with Matt Mardigan now some others have said that it's too generic I I guess I can kind of tell I, I can see what they mean I don't really agree and yeah I was honestly most worried that it would be an offensive depiction of little people or dwarves but yeah I I don't think so really but I you know I'm not a dwarf I don't know dwarves in real life so if if you are one or you know and it is please put it in the comments the stuff I was most looking forward to was fantasy genre stuff and yeah the movie delivered you know this is like it's been on Disney Plus for it, it was on there for a while before I actually added it to the list as something I was added to the schedule you know and, and for a while I wasn't sure if I was gonna do it but then they announced that they were gonna do a series following it up you know I'm not gonna do that with every Disney Plus series but you know this was something I already knew I remembered liking from before and you know yeah, I mean, if, if they do it with, like, a Michael Bay or Steven Sommers thing, I'm going to have to tap out. But, yeah, for this one, and, yeah, I'm glad I watched it again. And I guess I'll probably watch it again in about half a year right before the miniseries starts so that I have it fresh in my mind and can compare and such. And, yeah, honestly, I wouldn't say no. I'm, I might... I probably won't, but I could sit down and watch it again right after this review. I, I enjoy watching it a lot. Now, the trailer does give at least a little too much away, but it is also, you know, yeah, the trailer gives you a pretty good idea of if you'll like the movie or not, and the poster and cover also give a little bit too much away, but again give you a pretty good idea of what the movie is like right so when yeah I searched on YouTube and all I found were two clips three reaction videos two trailers neither of them fan ones four review analysis videos and three documentary ones yeah I I was a little surprised but when you read the a lot of the written reviews are very positive. This has a 51% on the tomato meter based on 57 reviews, but a 79% audience score based on over 100,000 ratings. And yeah, the critics' consensus is that state of the art special effects and an appealing performance from Warwick Davis can't quite save Willow from its slow pace and generic story. And yeah, the average critic rating is 5.90 out of 10. And where 29 are fresh, 28 are rotten. So yeah. And uh, let's see. Yeah, the, the, you know, once again, 79% audience score. The average rating was 3.9 out of 5. But yeah, the, according, you know, by the critics, this is rated rotten on Rotten Tomatoes and I guess I didn't find it on Metacritic I'm just gonna make sure that oh I did and I just forgot to copy it in but I have it here it has a 47 percent meta score out of 100 based on 12 critic reviews two positive nine mixed one negative and 
the user review is 7.7. .7. So yeah, in general, audiences liked it more than critics. And that's based on 32 ratings, 28 positive, 3 mixed, and 1 negative. And it's... there we go. Yeah, so on IMDb, there are 285 IMDb user reviews, which is not a lot for movies that are popular, but okay. And 114 links to external reviews in the IMDb external reviews section. And yeah, so of the of the 100 voted most pop useful, heh, that was a Freudian slip, most useful of the IMDb user reviews, there, you know, three voted, gave it one out of ten, no one gave it two out of ten, one for three out of ten, three for four out of ten, six for five out of ten, six for six out of ten, 17 for 7 out of 10, 28 for 8 out of 10, 14 for 9 out of 10, 27 for 10 out of 10. So, yeah, it is the the consensus of users say it's a good movie. And yeah, the overall rating on IMDb is 7.2 out of 10 based on 111,137 votes and yeah so 28.1 gave it a 7 24.6 an 8 12.6 a 10 11 gave it a 9 and 13.5 gave it a 6 and yeah so again largely popular now the Let's see the yeah. So the special effects are largely good and largely hold up. This is one of the first uses of ah, what's it called? Morphing, which was later seen in Terminator Two. And yeah, like there are a few effects where you can kind of see, okay, that you can tell how they did it, but largely they they did, like they, they hold up, you know, like I am aware how they did it because I've seen movies like this. I've seen a lot of behind the scenes, but when you just look and you let yourself be absorbed by the movie, very few of the effects, you know, are like you can tell are just effects and are distracting now yeah so quoting a few fellow critics here scary for kids jumping back and forth between danger and comedy and I think this is the kind of thing there are a few things that children might be bothered by. I think as long as they like talk with their parents about it afterwards. And I would like personally I I don't have children and I never will. But if I ever did, I would never show them a movie that I hadn't watched before myself. Now I know that's difficult. I get that. You can't do that with every movie out in theaters, for example. You can't just go watch it twice just to make sure it's okay for the kids every time there's a big... I get that, but... Yeah, the... the I think children over the age of 10 will be okay as long as they can talk with their parents about what they saw afterwards and, like you know deal deal with the emotions that it brings up but younger than that or ones that are sensitive or don't have a chance to to talk like if you if you show this to a 10 year old and then they have to go to bed right after 
that might, they might have trouble sleeping, you know. And yeah, so if you don't already have Disney Plus and you're considering getting it for this, you know, if you're a fan of George Lucas, you know, all nine star, all eleven Star Wars, all six real Star Wars movies, depending on how you look at it, are on Disney Plus, and the yeah, um, and there's a lot of special features for, especially I want to say it's like the original. Is it all three? It's definitely the you know, A New Hope and Empire Strikes Back have a lot. Like, I think there might have been hours worth of of special features. So, you know, the the yeah. And you know, if you're looking at this as something you might show children, and again, you don't already have Disney Plus, you know, it have. I believe they have all the Disney animated classics. Uh, wait, did they remove one or two because they were like racist? I, I forget. I, I agree with the idea that we should talk about the racist ones. Just getting rid of them doesn't necessarily really fix the. Anyway. And, you know, it has Pixar and various other stuff for, for kids. Yeah, so I rank this seven battles between good and evil out of ten. And it's close to an eight, but then Matt Mardigan or the Brownies open their mouths. But yeah, I would definitely say this is a movie that holds up, uh, you know. I probably wouldn't have enjoyed it as much today. If I hadn't already watched it when I was younger, or if I wasn't already a fan of George Lucas, but the the it yeah I I would show this to someone who isn't who knows nothing about George Lucas. Once again, provide you know yeah I already talked about age because yeah the like. Violence and such largely is stuff that kids can handle. Like, yeah, there are sword fights, but you don't see, like, stabs and blood and such. Like, yeah, it's not it's not a spoiler to say. Like, for example, Mad Mardigan uses a sword. And he won't, like, stab someone in a really gruesome-looking way. He will, like, hit them... Like, uh, let's, yeah, imagine this is, this is the, the chest of an enemy, and this is Mad Mardigan's sword. He'll, like, hit them like this, and then they'll fall, you know. So, yeah, you know, I, I think I saw someone saying that even that is too much for kids. Come on. Children think sword fights are cool. Like, as a gen... Not all of them, and I'm not saying that there's something wrong with you if you don't, but a lot of kids think that sword fights are cool, and I don't think we should take that away from... the As, as long... You know, don't show them, like, 300... Oh, crap. <laughs> okay, if, if there's a kid watching this video, I'm trusting you to not go and watch that movie. But, yeah probably shouldn't have shouldn't have told them the the thing that yeah unless it was reverse psychology but that does bring us to the spoiler section and i am just going to make a quick note of the time code before I continue, here we go. Notes taken while watching. So from here on out, spoilers for this movie, not for anything else. And the rest of, you know, this is where we get into my thoughts. So the rest of this video is not a review. It's a series of, well, thoughts. Some of it is analysis, some of it is MST3, Rift Tracks, and other jokes. 
and yeah, the, this first section, I'm going to start with, in you know, chronological order, thoughts that I had on the movie, you can think of it as a running commentary, live tweeting, or the like. Now, right, so I noted at the at the start that I read that a number of critics found it annoying that it cuts to the baby's reaction so frequently. Here at the start, I think it works. I guess it got a little old by the end, but I don't know. It, it didn't bother me too much. And I think, I mean, at the end of the day, without those reaction shots, a lot of the time, like, you... A lot of us know that that's not, they're not actually running around with an infant in all this dangerous condition. Like, they, you know, there are some shots where you can see the real baby and it looks, you know, but they made sure to, to secure everything. So without these reaction shots, it's basically a bunch of actors running around with, you know, something that's we're supposed to think of as a baby like I, I think it was necessary to do something like that otherwise it's just like okay can we stop pretending that it's like obviously we care about the baby nobody wants Queen Bev Morda to kill the baby but that's not a baby that is like small sack of potatoes or something in the rough shape of a baby so those fantasy dog creatures really are intense, like the barking, the running, and them attacking, and I guess killing the, the, ah, name of position is, I can't remember, but the, yeah, it's the, you know, she helped with the delivery of the baby. And Willow tries really hard to keep his family from getting attached to the baby, but to no avail. So the prefect starts out by assuming that Willow stole from him, tells him that he owes him money, says he will own his land and force him to work in the mines. You know, if I didn't know any better, I might think that George Lucas has some issues with capitalism. Seriously, though, I really appreciate putting this in a kid's movie, Make the Children Question Capitalism. I'm not saying we should have communism, but capitalists that talk like that should be questioned. Should, uh, not by the police or something, but I'm saying, like, we should say, you know, you, you shouldn't just let people behave like that. No. I, I thought the festival was, was quite nicely done. You know, it felt like a living, yeah, it felt like it was actually happening instead of just, you know, a couple of scenes and then some B-roll edited in strategically, you know. Now, for all that Willow must endure in the first chunk of this movie, he does get to show how courageous he is when he saves his child and runs home to his wife worried that something has happened to her. Willow's kids sure do have a lot of example of things that Willow should be scared of in the woods. Trolls that'll skin you and take your face. Oh. After all the things the prefect has said and done, it is funny to see him get sprayed with the baby's moment. Not, not the actor, but the character. The actor did a great job. I'm, I'm, I hear that he's act, that he was actually a really likable person in real life. So. But then, you know, yeah, it's hard to know what to believe when you know stories from Hollywood. I must perform perform the ritual to exile the child's spirit into oblivion. So I guess what you're saying is, if you only kill the child, it's just a matter of time before another one is born that will defeat you, but if you do the ritual, it'll never happen again. I'm not entirely sure why some reviewers completely missed that perfectly sound explanation. Like, it's not even subtle, she literally spells it out. Or, yeah. She literally 
announces it. You know, there's it's it's a completely clear yeah. We've got to give that baby to somebody. I'm somebody. He's right. Are you challenging my authority as far as the baby's concerned? Yes. That's a good start. Work your way up to everything else. Yeah. Like, right at the start, Men Mardigan is incredibly irritating. Like, it gets better, but man, early on, he is, like... I would have been pretty happy if the first time you met him was, like, when, yeah, when he gets, when, when, uh, let's see, when he and Sorsha, you know, when Sorsha realizes that he's only dressed up as a woman, you know, that, that was the first scene where I didn't hate him being, yeah. Say, can I have some of that water? Oof. I love me a good passive-aggressive sip of drink. Ah, oh, that's refreshing. Wow. Hot day. Get thirsty. There's a little bit left. Eh, whatever. Just, yeah. Okay, so that wasn't exactly what Willow did in the movie. Only in my mind. I quite like the conversation between Med Mardigan and Eric, getting some background on him, an update on how, just how bad the Evil Queen is, how bad the war is going. You want to go back to your families, I want to get out of this cage, at least half the audience is really, you know, really wants us to change the situation in some way because it's getting stale. I wouldn't steal from a baby. There's no challenge in it. Honestly, I probably should have seen coming that Matt Mardigan posing as a woman would culminate in the woman's husband realizing, but Matt Mardigan getting him to punch some of the guards instead, but it worked. It was fairly funny. Yeah, like I mentioned in the review, the horse-drawn carriage speeding is quite good. I like how gradually the carriage comes apart, like the wheels are breaking, and you have Mad Mardigan, Willow, and the brownies all doing different things. Like, the brownies are, like, trying to cut some, some rope or string or something, I forget exactly what, and Willow, like, this guy attacks Willow, and Willow, like, hits him with, like, a, a hammer, I think it was, and you have Mad Mardigan in, in, in a, yeah, in a, in a fight on top of it, just, yeah, really, really nicely. Look, I'm sorry. I got angry. We wouldn't have escaped. Wait, I'm sorry I got angry. It's sorry. We wouldn't have escaped without a man being vulnerable, in front of another man, apologizing, admitting fault, showing appreciation. Love to see it. See, I wish more of the movie was like that. If you really are a princess, take care of him. That is legitimately sweet. You know, Mad Mardigan gets caught almost as frequently as he says the word peck. That's at least twice that, yeah... And within a very short amount of time, too. Practice the spell I told you. Klaatu. Baratu. <laughs> Clever of the the raven, Raziel, to imitate the baby. That was also legitimately kind of funny. Like, you know, the baby's crying because that's what's, you know, that is something babies sometimes do. And the, you know, Brazil is like, oh, I gotta do something, but I can't do magic. So just, so it like wails, imitating the crying. It's, yeah. And the slide down the snowy mountains with, on the shield are also exciting and funny. You're a worthless thief. I am not a thief. That was the part that bothered you. 
But yeah, that is like, who's scruffy looking? And Sorcia and Valkyma have that, and Mardigan have that kind of romance where at first they hate each other, then they love each other. An annoying trope, but it was common at the time. In real life, if there's a person who keeps expressing that they can't stand you, don't try to romance them. Don't expect you're going to end up together. I really like the scene at the castle with the guerrilla tactics. The, you know, Mad Mardigan sets up like he he has several, you know, he puts on armor. He has several crossbows ready and he plants like a... Um, I think it's a bear trap. I don't think it's a reverse bear trap, you know, for capturing the elusive reverse bear. But yeah, st you know, stuff like that. Absolutely love it. And, you know, I, I quite like that until Willow develops confidence, when he uses magic, most of the time it either just doesn't help, sometimes it makes things worse. Like, you know, he's trying to deal with this troll, which is a nuisance, and he accidentally creates the two-headed fire-breathing dragon, which is a huge problem. You know, so, yeah. You know, yeah. Once he has confidence and really applies himself, he was applying himself the whole time, but I'm saying that is an important part. It were, you know, yeah. Once he does that, it works to great effect, which is a good lesson to teach children in real life if you're trying to say, convince a group of people to treat another group of people better. If you don't come across as confident and you don't make a strong case, like, you shouldn't have to, but sometimes you have to, you might make them dislike the other group more, and you're certainly unlikely to make them treat the other group better, even if you don't make them dislike them even more. Now, let's... Yeah, and in general, the, the two-headed dragon was, was really cool, like, you know, Willow tries to run past it, but it, you know, it spits fire, dropping some incredible rhymes. And, yeah, he's he's stuck, and he ends, like, yeah. And then, you know, I also, that was, that was one thing that did make me laugh. The, you know, Mad Mardikin, like, gets out his sword, and it's, like, swinging to try to be, like, intimidating. And, like... The army that he's trying to, you know, scare off, they, like, back up. But it's not because, of, you know, he thinks it's because of him. We can tell it's because of the, the dragon behind him. You know, and at first he's like, oh. And then he does notice. And then he runs at, you know. And then, the, yeah, they had to push it too far. He runs at the people that he was trying to fight. And then they're like, well, you know. It felt like a cartoon. Like... You know, yeah, the when when the that yeah that that bit where the the wily coyote has painted on the on the rock a um what yeah what looks like a path so that the roadrunner will run into the rock, but then the roadrunner does run, and so he goes up and he tries to run and then he hits the just yeah felt like a cartoon. But, but yeah, the, the dragon, you know, breathing fire, and like, let me think, it was because, let's see, I think someone came at Willow with a sword, and Willow manages to launch him onto the top of the head of one of the dragons, and so the spear goes from the top of its head out the bottom, and like as you know apparently when it exhales fire comes out it can only go so long without exhaling you know so and and it doesn't i don't think it has like a nose that it could come out so if it doesn't open its mouth yeah the head blows up like that so yeah and yeah the the part where the army is transformed in pigs is intense for children's entertainment and once again, they use they effectively use guerrilla tactics by tracking tra tra tricking the queen's men into thinking that the only people capable of fighting now are the two wizards, uh, the sorcerers, but all the warriors were just hiding under blankets. And they entered the queen's room, where the 
where you know she's doing the the ritual and the good guys fight off some of her guards Sorsha kicks one of them in the face great now he's gonna fall in love with her too and Babmorda sets fire to Rizel, who fights back by shooting her with cold. Chill out. I'm guessing Babmorda screaming as she wakes up when Rizel thought that she had stopped her probably also gave a kid or two nightmares. And General Kale kills Eric, and then... Yeah, man... Um... Yeah, Matt Morgan, you know, has to fight Kale, even though Eric is supposed to be a better fighter. So, yeah, that was a compelling scene, and... I legitimately wasn't sure if Willow was going to be able to turn Bavmorda into stone with the acorn. And Willow does his disappearing pig trick, and Bavmorda gets so upset that she accidentally... Like, she knocks over some of the ritual stuff, and, yeah, the ritual works on her, you know, so, so yeah, we're told that she is now gone forever, and, yeah, you know, there's, there's no blood, it's not violent or anything, and, yeah, another good message for kids, if you toy around with something dangerous, it could hit yourself. And Willow gets a very positive reception coming home, and... Willow turns an apple into a bird, and the prefect gets hit in the face by its poop. Makes quite a good target for that. First vomit, now bird poop. Is that part of Willow's powers? Are, are they partially poop-related? Poop targeting spells? Because that seems like quite the coincidence. Why would it even already need to poop if it only just came into existence? I am way overthinking this I th yeah I'm just gonna move on to the next so yeah Lucas according to Wikipedia Lucas named the character of General Kale Petroach after film critic Pauline Kale a fact that was not lost on Kale in her printed review of the film she referred to General Kale as an homage à moi which you know you, you probably know the word homage, but à moi means of me or towards me, something like that, you know. Tiny bit of, that that's some of the only French I know. And similarly, the two-headed dragon was called an Ebor Sisk, after f film critics Gene Siskel and Roger Ebert, which, yeah, because they weren't quite the, the biggest fans of, I mean, that is significantly Actually, I come to think of it, I guess that is more or less on the same level as what John Carpenter turned some of his critics into. I can't really say which movie, because it's a spoiler. Uh, yeah, anyway. I think that is... Right, a, a couple of... Um, let's see, yeah. Quoting Philip Critics here, once Sorsha falls for Mad Morgan, she just stands around, barely has more dialogue. That actually, like, I forget what she says, but she says something when approaching the queen, and it is like, like, I forgot she knew how to speak, because she hadn't spoken since she fell for him, and that, like, apparently there was a thing, like, when we see the the that castle where the people inside have been frozen in uh, um yeah yeah frozen apparently her father was one of the people frozen and originally she was looking for him but they cut it and i can understand what like the movie's already 15 to 20 minutes longer than it absolutely has to be so yeah but it does mean that she has nothing once they, yeah. At first, the two sorcerers use magic against each other. After a while, they just start hitting each other. The brownies don't really get to take part in the action because most of the time they're worried about getting stepped on. 
Seeing the army be transformed slowly and painfully into pigs is shocking. Of course, it's not the first time Lucas has put something scary in a PG movie. Yeah, those were my notes. So, please go to the comment section and let me know what is your favorite movie that is like this. What do you hope to see in the Disney Plus show? Are there any characters that you hope will show up in that? Or at least maybe like their offspring since it's been... It's, let's see, what is it? From 88 to 2022, that is, I guess, 44? No, wait. 34. 34 years. Yeah. So, some... Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Um... Crap, I forget her name, but I can find it really quickly. The uh, She was in Solo, and her name is Erin Kellyman. And I know not everybody likes, you know, yeah, Solo and... Oh, wow, she was like 19 when they did Solo, I guess. Okay, anyway... I know not everybody liked her in Solo, not everybody liked her in The Falcon, The Winter Soldier, but I did, and I'm looking forward to, she plays Jade in the, yeah. Anyway, if, you know, yeah, what is your favorite, all-time favorite fantasy movie in general? I guess I will go ahead and say, for me, it is probably one of the Lord of the Rings. Yeah. If you like this video, please thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page. One or more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested view if you watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week, reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie and one talking about my spoiler-filled thoughts on the most recent episode of the current Disney Plus MCU show, which these days is Ms. Marvel, and one talking about my spoiler-filled thoughts on the most recent episode of the current Disney Plus Star Wars show, which these days is Obi-Wan Kenobi. And recently, the reviews and thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you want more videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog as well as catch my video next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording. And I'll catch you next time.